Hi, this is Nicole DiGiacomo from Cork Books. I am joined by Melanie Anderson and Lisa Kroger, of the, um, co-authors of Monster She Wrote, the, um, uh, the, uh, the Stoker Award nominated um, nonfiction book about women, the women who pioneered weird fiction. Thanks for joining me, ladies. Thanks for having us here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. Um, I just wanted to start off by asking a little bit about how you two connected and ended up writing this book. Uh, sure, I could talk a little bit about that, and I guess, and you can plug up any holes I leave, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, Lisa and I just happened to be in the same graduate program at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi. So I guess it was maybe the second year I was there. I was in my master's, uh, working on my master's degree. And Lisa came in as a new student and she was assigned by the powers that be to my office. So we had three people in the office and the other person was Matt, who was our co-host on the No Fear Cast uh, podcast that we have. And uh, Lisa and I would get to talking because we would have office hours and students wouldn't uh, show up much for those office hours so we would just happen to be in there and we got to talking about books that we liked reading um i think we kind of bonded a bit over shirley jackson at first because i had just read the haunting of hill house uh, like a year or two before and was reading more of her stuff and we just got to talking about things that we were interested in and it seemed like we were both interested in kind of supernatural or creepy horror things and we both were working on projects when we started our PhDs that were related as well. So I was writing my dissertation on Toni Morrison and how she uses the supernatural in her books. And Lisa was writing about the traditional Gothics, like with a capital G, you know, British writers in the 18th century who were writing Gothic books. And she was focusing on women writers doing that. And so we both, we both kind of had these similar entrances and valences in our research. And we just, we kind of ended up working on projects together that were more of an academic nature because of that. Uh, we ended up, uh, while we were still graduate students, we started collecting essays for uh, an academic essay collection on ghosts and literature and film. And we co-wrote the introduction for that. Um, and then a few years later, we were still keeping in touch and we did an academic essay collection on Shirley Jackson. And we ended up writing the introduction for that together. Um, but I mean, I think it's safe to say, Lisa, that we we were thinking about something like Monster She Wrote probably long before Monster She Wrote came to be, don't you think? I think so. I mean, I, I know we both really wanted to do something that had to do with the uh, women who kind of built up horror and the adjacent genres, like the darker genres. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, we both had uh, I, you put it so much more eloquently. I feel like most of our discussions were just about ghost stories <laughs> <laughs> and the Gothic and anything like that, that, that surrounded it. And, um, yeah, I had, I had read a, a little bit of Shirley Jackson. And then after I met Mel and she was just preaching the gospel of Jackson, I went and read a lot more of her stuff. And we had this conversation about how, we felt like a lot of people, when you talked about horror literature, especially, uh, didn't associate that with women at all. Um, I mean, even even the gothics, you know, somebody like Anne Radcliffe would be considered more, I don't know, romantic literature. It, it really wasn't even put into that category at all. And, um, you know, when you talked about horror, especially in the academic world, you talked about Edgar Allan Poe or maybe like H.P. Lovecraft and we were we were just we were screaming mainly about Shirley Jackson <laughs> and then that led to a lot more you know um uh Mary Shelley with Frankenstein and Daphne du Maurier and from that point we had been talking for a really long time about wanting to do something like this we just didn't know what shape it would take and I was really excited when we were finally at the point where we were talking about well, what would this actually look like if it was a book? Like if we were going to make this a book project and, and try to convince people that, you know, horror really in a lot of ways does belong to women, how would it look? And that was, that was really the start of Monster She Wrote, but it, yeah, it's been going on for a while with the two of us, I think. <laughs> 
Yeah, and we were lucky we held those conversations and experienced writing those intros together because by the time we started working on actually writing Monster She Wrote, the process was so much smoother than if we had just been talking about the idea and had not worked together before. Um, so that, you know, that was really good as well. Yeah, Mel, Mel and I joked a lot as we were writing this that we kind of share a writing brain because we worked on other projects together and we've known each other for so long that she would start writing something and maybe get distracted having to go teach a class or grade papers or something and I would hop in the document we were working on and finish it out and she said it, she would sit down it would be like Elle's just finished <laughs> the chapter and uh it, it was just funny because we we yeah I think it just shows that we've known each other for so long that we can kind of write seamlessly together it's fun it's really fun yeah, I think one of my, I think one of the best examples of that was I was running late to go teach and I had started writing one of the chapters. I don't even remember which one. I think it was the one that had to, we mentioned psychical societies, which is something that I knew about. And so I was, I was like, oh, I'm running out of time. So I, I just started writing like words that I would have used, like keywords, like dates and just, it was crazy. It was like this stream of consciousness mess. And later Lisa had done something with it. And she was like, oh, I looked at it at first. I was like, what is this? And she was like, then I was like, oh, that's what Mel wanted to do. And <laughs> she just wrote it out. I was like, okay, it makes perfect sense. So yeah. And then toward the end of the book and then some of the stuff we've written since we've started writing together at the same time in Google Docs, which we were using Google Docs before, but we passed them back and forth. But lately we've been doing stuff where we've been trying to write at the same time. And that's been really cool too, because it's just neat to, I feel like Lisa almost knows how I think now because she's seen me literally writing and revising myself or we'll both be writing in a doc and then switch and be revising each other. And it really does sometimes. I think one of the articles that we wrote post monster, she wrote each sentence was, it was almost like Lisa wrote a sentence and then I did one, then she did one. Then, then, cause we just went back and forth basically as we were going or like one of us will be typing while the other one is talking or something, you know, but we work really well in, in tandem like that, which like Lisa said is a lot of fun. I have to ask, how did you, uh, narrow down what it is that um, what it is uh, that you wanted to like how did you choose the authors because there are a lot of women um, women who have written in, in this genre and I'm sure you had to cut some um, and I'm sure you even discovered some that you didn't even know about can you talk a little bit about that you want to go ahead Lisa or do you want me to uh, start? yeah um... I mean, this was the most fun I had working on a project and researching it because there were already so many people that we were reading and women that we loved reading. I think the hardest thing was trying to narrow it down and not have it be a 10 volume book <laughs> um, because there were so many women that we wanted to put in there and we didn't. Um, or maybe we gave like a passing mention to that we thought that we really gave serious debate, you know, should they be have their own entry? Should it, should this be another chapter? And we were trying to fit things together. So that was a bit of a frustration, but at the same time, it was so much fun because we literally had every excuse in the book to go out there and read things that we wanted to read, either that we wanted to reread or that we hadn't read before. So, um, I don't know. I just, I found the research. I, I found it so much fun. I don't know if you did. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, at, at some points we were working uh, so fast is probably not that, but we were working pretty hard to churn stuff out. And so it was it wasn't difficult to like keep up with the research, but sometimes I felt like I was researching like six things at once, <laughs> but it was fun. Cause I like that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, I do academic writing normally, so I'm always researching either for teaching or just looking up something. So it was really cool to have this excuse to just dive down all these rabbit holes. And I realized while we were working on it that Lisa and I, you know, obviously we were trained in research the same in some ways, but she also had way more ideas about sources and stuff because she'd worked on British literature and just did a different project than me in graduate school. So I think we learned, I know I learned a lot from you, Lisa, about like finding sources and stuff. And I'm assuming I was also bringing some stuff too that you might not have thought of because I was delving into, 
you know, I was doing some historical research on the pulps because it was just so difficult to find stuff on that. Um, then, we, of course, we ended up finding the archives, which helped us. But yeah, it was, I think I joked at one point that I kind of felt like Indiana Jones sometimes because <laughs> I would find a mention of something, but not be sure like where it was or how to find it or like just come up against a brick wall. And so, yeah, I mean, I was, I was using interlibrary loan and all the databases and we were looking up like research other people had done to try to see where they had found stuff and it was kind of like a weird puzzle um and yeah i enjoyed it a lot it, it gave me an excuse to read a bunch of stuff that i might not have normally been reading um during a semester because we were writing during a summer and then at least one semester so i was getting to do a lot of reading that i'm now working into my classes actually there's a couple of books i'm teaching this semester that i probably would not have gotten to in time to do that if i hadn't been reading a bunch of stuff for monster she wrote so yeah just the the amount of material that we were having to go through was really fun and now there's just so much more i mean we would never reach the end i mean there's so much more that we could have even done so it can be overwhelming but if you like it it can be really fun too I, I like that. It, it would have been the book that never ended. <laughs> yeah, we had to quit in some spots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it, I mean, there, there were so many that we wanted to uh, read about and include that at some point we were just like, we just can't. But going back to when you said we felt like Indiana Jones, it did feel like that sometimes because between you kind of had the 20th century American covered you know, I had the 18th, 19th century British, you know, Gothic kind of cover. So we had a good base to start from, from the two of us. But there were a lot more that we had to, to research, like you mentioned the pulp. And I mean, when Mel says that we were digging for information, I, I know I, I was reading, if I could get a hold of them, I was reading pulp magazines from like the 40s. And you were like a detective because you had to go through not just the stories themselves or the articles in the in the magazines, but we were going through like letters to the editor that would be written in. It would be like, oh, there's one mention of, of you know, Margaret St. Clair here. We have to follow this or, um, you know, any of those women. And we, we were having to build, um, build, especially the biographical entries that way, where we would just get like a sentence from there was a footnote in this magazine about this one woman and we'd grab that and then that would point us somewhere else or a letter to an editor would mention you know this person was profiled in this magazine we have to go back and try to find that and so you were just piecing it together um, of course the downside to that is that we there were several women we wanted to include especially in that section that we couldn't because it ended up either we couldn't find the information on them or the information we found we didn't know if we could trust it <laughs> so it you know we just kind of had to be well you know maybe that's a bigger project for another day but that ended up being probably the most heartbreaking part of the research for this was having somebody that we loved their stories and we wanted to talk about them but we couldn't just because we didn't know anything about who they were i think there was even you know uh, a woman we were researching who we weren't even sure if her name was a pseudonym or not mm -hmm. <laughs> so there was no way to research it and it was um I don't know that was that was hard for me was to feel like okay here's this great writer but we can't include her because we just don't know anything yet um but it, it was fun and I did feel like Indiana Jones I mean I I still kind of feel like Indiana Jones when I <laughs> when I research some of these women <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about some of these women that were that you weren't able to include and um, why you wanted to include them, um, even though you couldn't find enough information for it? Um, I think one of the ones that kind of pops into my mind, and I may be getting her name wrong, Lisa. I think we mentioned her in the book. Is it is her is it Gray Gray La Spin Spina La Spina? Is that how you pronounce the name, Lisa? I guess, yeah, Lespina, 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 I don't know. Yeah. Um, she wrote a vampire story that I'm not even sure, wait, you were able to find the story to read it, right? She was the one where you found yeah. the story, Anti-Massacre, Anti-Massacre. 
And I saw her name mentioned through a couple of the historians um, that, I, that I was looking through to try to get information about these women. And that was a one that we just couldn't, the blurbs about her were so slight that there was really no way to give her own chapter. So I think we kind of sprinkled her name um, throughout uh, so that people could could go find her if they wanted to and try to read her stories. But like I said, I mean, I think we were only able to track down maybe one or two of her stories. Um, so yeah, that's one that just immediately comes to my mind. Um, who was the one, and I'm not, there was one who we weren't even sure if she was a man or a woman, if it was a man that had adopted a woman's name, and I can't, <laughs> I can't I think remember first, now who it was. I think the first name was Allison, wasn't it? Allison something? Or Alice? Yeah, and I kept seeing the name yeah. over and over again. I actually started trying to track the person down. And then, yeah, it turned out that some uh, one of the historians thought that it might have been a man who was using a woman's pseudonym. So we just dropped that one. But, uh, yeah, I would I would have to look it up. But I think the first name was Allison. It started with an A. Yeah, there, there were, I'll, I'll remember it probably like at three o'clock in the morning. And right, yeah. <laughs> you can text me tomorrow like, morning. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, there, there were quite a few, and, and that was a big problem too, is especially during the pulp times. I mean, really from like the 30s, 40s, and 50s, is there were so many people writing these stories. But there were so many people adopting pseudonyms too, and, and not just one pseudonym, but like three. There might be one person writing under three or four names. And that became really confusing because, I mean, thank goodness there are a few people who are trying to like uh, collect these into archives. Um, but other than that, we just, we don't have a lot of it. And, and a lot of it was just people who were trying to capitalize on the fiction of the day and what was popular. And, you know, so they were just writing stories like crazy and, and it, none of it was documented, like what name went with what actual human being. And so that, that became really, um, really problematic when you got to researching that. So I'm kind of proud of that chapter in and of itself of the pulp chapter that we were actually able to shine a light on a few of these women because that, that I think was the most troublesome chapter, honestly. <laughs> if I were to pick one mm -hmm. um yeah. but I love it well and then there's I think the chapter that we did on like women writing the supernatural in the 19 1900s um in the early 20th century we had what like five or six names or something but there were tons of women doing that I mean that was how a lot of women were making money then so at, at when you're told you have to have a certain number of pages for the book <laughs> and you have to cover a certain number of years <laughs> there's no way I mean we could have written a whole monster she wrote on 19th century women ghost story writers probably even then we would have had some trouble with biographical information but like Mary Braddon you know while she's mainly known for sensational fi fiction wrote some ghost stories and we ended up I think gesture at her and not giving her a chapter because we felt like she gets taught a lot. Uh, Mary Wilkins Freeman, a fan, an amazing ghost story writer. I've been uh, reading some of her ghost stories I hadn't gotten to yet um, in the last couple months and they're so creepy. Um, but she's anthologized and people are reading her like all the time in their courses, uh, in, in American Lit courses. And so we're thinking like, well, is that a person who's so well known that maybe we shouldn't include them? Like, are there other people that maybe people aren't as aware of that maybe we should put in? So we ended up, we ended up having to make a lot of decisions like that. And we tried, you know, to kind of sprinkle some names through. I mean, I hate to put it that way, but we would try to be like, hey, if you like this, then go check out this, because we wanted to show that there's so much more out there than we were able to, you know, put in the book. Um, and also when you have women writers writing in so many genres, genres it gets difficult too, because we were trying to look at dark genres, but we could have women who maybe wrote something that seemed darker to us, but was mainly science fiction writer or something. And so you also have that, the slipperiness, I think, of the different kinds of writing 
um, that women were doing. So yeah, I mean, I think if someone's reading Monster She Wrote and they're thinking, oh, there's all these other people, that's good. <laughs> like, go with those <laughs> other people too. <laughs> I know that we probably had some hard decisions to make. I mean, I just dis I discovered a woman who was writing occult detective fiction like last semester. I don't even remember how. I think I was looking for more occult detective fiction to read for a project. I don't even remember her name now. It was Rose something. It was a French name. Never heard of her. And I couldn't really find much information about her at all. And I mean, it's sad, but that's kind of what happened. Uh, there's some people that we just, we have the stories sometimes, but we don't necessarily have, you know, a lot of biographical information. Um, and yeah, it's literally a never ending story because we're going to be every day, we could discover a new woman writing in the past or now that you you're not aware of, um, which is really cool, I think, and fun. But also, like, you know, you're not going to read everything before <laughs> before the end of your life. It's impossible. <laughs> so we, we couldn't maybe be as comprehensive as, <laughs> as we would like to be, but we, we tried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we did have some hard debates. And, you know, um, I mean, people who are even favorites of mine, like Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who I would have loved to have given more, um, you know, more time to in the book. But then at the same time, I was like, well, she's mythologized a lot. Or, you know, somebody like Octavia Butler, who, you know, definitely was writing in the space of horror. But then a lot of times she's kind of more science fiction. So we thought, well, maybe we'll just gesture at her and put the spotlight on somebody else that that might not be as well known. But then that was still a really hard decision because we love those writers. And, um, but yeah, I always tell people, I'm like, this is just a starting point. Like this, this is just a, um, you know, <laughs> we're, we're showing, we're kind of like pointing the flashlight in the right way. And we expect you to like run and, and go read more people than we can read. Um, <laughs> I think that's a good way to approach the book. Yeah, those reading lists are amazing and I feel like they are a reader's dream because it just like there's so much to discover from there. Um, have you have you kind of I'm assuming you guys read all those books that you kind of recommended. Did you both read them all all or did you like kind of decide like I'm gonna tackle this and you tackle that? Um, because it really is, I mean like if you were to like that's kind of like you said you can't read everything like for the rest of your life there's a lot to cover yeah I, mean, for, I, I, I was just gonna say for my part that i mean there are things in monster she wrote that lisa read that i did not read uh at, at one point in the beginning yeah we read a lot together but there are things where i would be writing about something and i would be like okay well i'm trying to do this book and this book and this book and i would say to lisa like have you read this and she'd be like yes yeah, so that she would take that and so we did a lot of trading back and forth based on like what we knew about the books but yeah we were doing a lot we, we were going off a lot of reading that we'd already done in the past especially with the early chapters but yeah there was i mean I'm sitting at my kitchen table right now. And while we were working on Monster She Wrote, it was so full of books. <laughs> like I could only see books over my laptop. It's like I couldn't see the other side of the wall because I was just reading stuff all the time or trying to put stuff on my Kindle. But I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I'll say, I know there are things that Lisa read that I just was not able to get to at the time. Cause I would just be like, well, I'm working on this and I'm not sure I'm gonna have time to read this. Is there something that I've read that I could take off your hands and vice versa? So that's probably also how we, we had like both of us working on different sections. Cause there was stuff that Lisa could bring to something that I maybe couldn't or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of, most, I would say, most of the um, entries in the chapters that we highlighted, the majority of it we both have read. Mm -hmm. Like, there's nothing in here that neither one of us have not read, <laughs> because we didn't want, we didn't want to recommend something or put something in there that, um, that we, yeah, that we, we didn't feel right kind of having our name on it <laughs> and recommending it and then not liking it, but I think especially when it came to the reading list at the end of each entry and especially the last chapter, which we tried to treat like a big extended reading list, um, just to kind of, um, we thought that would be a good way to end the book was to give people a bunch of <laughs> reading to do because we assumed readers were loving the book. They, those were the ones who were going to buy the book. 
And um, by the time we got to that, we did have to kind of say, okay, like you've read a lot more vampire fiction than I have. So what do you recommend? Or, you know, well, you've read a lot more haunted house fiction. What do you recommend? And so, you know, there are some in there that, you know, Mel, only Mel read, but I haven't read yet. Um, although I'm catching up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I actually did. That. That. Yeah, I kept track of stuff. <laughs> Once we got to the end and that was happening, I kept track of things and I'm still yeah. reading stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh yeah, it's it's fun. Um I it's it's I feel like this book is kind of its own living thing because I know a lot of readers have contacted me and said like, "Oh, you just grew my who be red pile by <laughs> like an infinite amount." And I'm just like, "Yes, I love to hear that." Um but also it does that with me too, because I have found now that I seek out, like if I'm in the mood for a haunted house book or a serial killer book, I'm going to go and seek out um, some of these women writers that I haven't read before. And that's been so much fun is to kind of find new authors that I haven't read or um, yeah, it just, it feels like a very organic, alive, organism in and, of, in and of itself that's just going to constantly like be there um, at least for me because there's always something new to go back and read and that's that's a lot of fun um so yeah, yeah. when I was when I was working on that final haunted house chapter that was when I first read Sherry Priest's The Family Plot because I think you had mentioned it to me Lisa and I just never got to it so I'm like well I'm writing about haunted house books to read I'm going to read it loved it so you know it ended up in that <laughs> chapter but like now right now I'm reading her book Agony House kind of I don't know it got put on hold when I got changed to online teaching and <laughs> Had a bunch of work to take care of um but i have the toll so yeah i mean there are there are women writers that lisa told me about when we were writing the book or that we discovered or you know we read while we were working on it that now i'm reading other stuff that they wrote um so that's been that's been fun too um because it did not only were we trying really hard to read everything for the book but then yeah we got trapped in our own extended tbrs as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before we wrap up, could you maybe give us a glimpse of what your what's on your TBR pile um, for the next few months? Oh, man, that's a good goodness. question. Yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know who I've been reading a lot, and I wish we had given her more space in the book, is because um, she kind of fits with somebody like Toni Morrison, who a lot of people think of as literary but not maybe not like dark or genre is uh, Joyce Carol Oates. And she has got some really, she's got some fantastic short stories that fit into the horror genre. She's got a whole collection of them, maybe more than one collection by now. Um, and she's actually got a book about a serial killer too, which I think we did mention that one in the book, um, which I highly recommend, but I've been going back and reading a lot of her short stories and I've been really, really enjoying them um so that's one that's on my kind of perpetual to be red pile Mel, what about you well you ordered me to read mona awad's bunny so <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna have to do that at some point or i'll probably get in trouble i'm assuming <laughs> <laughs> I, I may have texted her like every day for two weeks <laughs> saying, have you read bunny yet <laughs> yeah I was a big fan of that book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I just finished reading Helen Yemi's White is for Witching to teach it. And I've been thinking about reading more of her stuff because I have, you read Gingerbread and you've told me to read that mm -hmm. one. So I, yeah. I think I'll, I might dive a little bit deeper into Oya Yemi than I already have. Because I read White is for Witching and Boy Snow Bird. Um, so yeah, Gingerbread might be up next for me. I don't know. I have piles and piles of books I want to get to. <laughs> yep, same. <laughs> well, I'll let you guys get back to your reading. Um, thank you so much for talking about Monsters She Wrote with us, um, Melania and Lisa. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.